Okay, welcome to part three. We are just about done with this Algebra 1 comprehensive review. Let's jump right into number 19. So first things first, I want to show you these two down here, these two rules that you've got to remember. This question is all about your exponential properties. The product rule tells us if I have two exponents with the same base and I multiply them, it's just the same base raised to the sum of those two exponents. So for example, if I had x squared times x to the seventh, that would be x to the ninth. That's a nine, x to the ninth. That's the product rule. You definitely have to remember that it only applies when the bases are the same. So with that in mind, the second rule is the power rule. Now, if I had the same x to the second, but it was raised to the seventh power, that's the only time we actually multiply the exponents. That would be x to the 14th power. So with those two rules in mind, let's take a look at this. When I see this up here, they're basically asking us, taking uh, this exponential function that we have, which of these three expressions is equivalent to that, okay? So we're gonna have to take this and see if we can break it down. So uh, I'm gonna leave the two out for a second. I wanna focus on the three to the two M plus one. Now, if you remember this looking, this part right here without the two looks just like the product rule where we're adding two things up in our exponent so we can actually break that up. That's the same thing as three to the two M times three to the first power and there's still a two out here multiplying everything so um if you look that's three to the two m we can actually combine the two and the three that's two times three we can multiply in any order that we want that's six times three to the two m and if you look that's numeral one not numer numeral did i say that right <laughs> number one um so basically we can if we see any answer choice that does not include this numeral one we can get rid of it so if you look, we just cut our answer choices in half. So with this in mind, I'm gonna use this same example right here, and we're gonna try and see if we can break this part down right there. Because if you notice, we have two things, two terms being multiplied in our exponent. That looks an awful lot like the power rule. So let's see if we can break that up. Three to the two M, that's the same thing as three squared raised to the power of M. Now you could write it as three M raised to the power of two. They just didn't do that in this case. Um, but I do want you to know we could do that. So there's still the two multiplying. There's still the three multiplying. But you know that three squared is just what? That's just a nine. So if I replace that, if I replace that with nine, the two and the three still multiply together and we get a six times nine raised to the M power. And that looks just like numeral three right there. So it has to be one and three. That would be our answer choice. So this is purely just testing how comfortable are you with your exponent properties. If you're not comfortable with the product rule or the power rule, there's a lot of other rules for exponents as well. You want to make sure you're 100% comfortable with those because they will definitely pop up on your final exam for algebra one. So number 20 is covering our favorite topic, systems of linear equations. So <laughs> let's take a look at it. Um, what I do want you to know is when they're asking us uh, which of these systems has the same solutions as the system that we have here, that's the same thing as them asking uh, which of those is an equivalent system. That's what we're finding. I do want you to know that term because they could ask you that. Which of these is an equivalent system to this? Same exact thing. All I want you to know here is if, if you remember way back when you first learned about solving equations, if I do something to both sides of an equation, uh, if I add something to the same thing to both sides, if I multiply both sides by the same thing, um, I don't actually change the overall uh, solution. Okay, so we're going to use that here. It, it applies just to systems as well as it does to just one equation. The same idea. If I add the same thing to both sides of an equation, I don't actually change it. If I multiply both things, both sides, both sides of an equation, I don't actually change it. So what you have to look and see is, okay, well, which of these equations is that true? So if you look at this one, number one, 6x minus 2y, that looks like they took the first equation and multiplied both sides by 2. So that's good. And you might think, hey, okay, well, Justin said that's, that's how you find out. But if you look at the bottom equation, it looks like they took the bottom equation and multiplied the first term times negative 3, but they didn't multiply the second term times negative 3. They only multiplied it by positive three, so that's automatically out. You need to multiply everything of one equation by the same exact thing. In this case, well, we're multiplying, but I could be adding or subtracting the same thing from both sides. So we automatically know it's not one. If you look at uh, number three, it looks like they took the first equation uh, and they multiplied the first term, three X, by negative three. That's how they got negative nine X. But if I multiply negative Y by negative three, I should get a positive three Y. I don't have that here. We're not multiplying by the same thing. But if you look at number two, it looks like I'm taking the first equation, 3x. And if you take a look, you could probably guess. I, I hope you look and say, all right, well, the first equation times 6, there's 18x. 
minus y times 6, that's minus 6y. 7 times 6, that's 42. So we multiplied both sides of the top equation by 6. That's good. The bottom equation, it looks like we multiplied both sides of the equation by 2. 2x two time, two excuse me, times 2 is 4x. 3y times 2 is 6y. 12 times 2 is 24. So we multiplied both sides of the bottom equation by the same thing. So number 2 is equivalent. It looks completely different, but it actually has the same exact solutions as that system because we did the same operation to both sides of the equation. In the first equation, we multiplied by 6. The bottom equation, we multiplied both sides by 2. Okay. And you can verify number four. There's probably, well, there must be something wrong with that one that they didn't do. Um, and I'll tell you right now, they multiplied the bottom equation by the wrong thing for some of these terms. Okay, so long story short, I knew this was going to be kind of a long-winded, uh, and I apologize, question or answer. But uh, for systems that have the same solutions, aka equivalent systems, you need to multiply uh, both sides of the equation. It doesn't have to be both. I could just do one equation, and I can just mess with that. Multiply both sides by the same thing or add both sides to uh, both uh, add I can't even talk add the same thing to both sides of the equation and that would give you an equivalent system that would be another system that has the same solutions okay so this is just uh, systems of equations equivalent systems all that fun stuff if you're not comfortable with that Google this and get some practice with that I'm sure I'll have something in the description that'll link you uh, to a good worksheet for that so for 21 it looks like we're given an exponential function representing the population of paramecia and the important thing here is t is the number of days since the population was first observed. Okay, so right at the beginning, t is just basically starting um, from the beginning. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second. Which domain is most appropriate to determine the population over the course of the first two weeks? Okay, t is the number of days. Um, what I want you to think of is what makes the most sense. And again, domain is just our um, all the values of our independent variable. Usually it's x. In this case, it's t. What I want you to think of is what makes the most sense from the start to the end or for the starting point and the ending point. To start, usually when we do these types of uh, time problems, almost always, like a very significant percentage of the time, time is always going to start at zero. It almost never makes sense in these, you know, for algebra one, algebra two, pre-calc, it never makes sense to be talking about negative time. Okay, we usually no never do that, right? So what I want you to be comfortable with is it looks like time is going to start at zero. That'll be our initial point for the domain. And then if you look, if they're saying, okay, well, to, to, to figure out the population over the course of the first two weeks, it's really tempting to say, okay, well, it's in between zero and two, but you've got to remember what your units are. The T is, is given to us a number of days. Well, how many days are in two weeks? That is correct, 14. <laughs> but what we have here, this would make the most sense. Given what they told us, we're starting at the initial point. That's what I meant. I said I'd get back to that. The initial point is zero. Our ending point would be 14. 14 days, two weeks. That makes the most sense uh, for that one. Okay, it's everybody's favor. We get to figure out which of these representations is correct for the data set. I never liked these growing up, full disclosure, but we have to do them because you will see them in this test. So um, at least they give us the data points already um, in ascending order. So that's kind of nice. That's a lot of the work right there. All I want you to do with the dot plot is just figure out, okay, do we have, they will try to trick you. You will look at this and be like, okay, there's 165, there's 470s, there's 380s, and you might stop and say, yeah, it's probably the rest the same. Make sure you go into the end. There's 185, there's 290s. There's three 95s and there's one 100. So we definitely know that one is an answer choice. And we can go ahead and based on last problem, we can get rid of anything that does not include the numeral one. So that's three. So we got rid of one already. The box and whisker plot, a lot of you guys probably haven't seen that in a bit. Let me just show you basically how we do this. The whiskers go to the highest and the lowest point. So 65 and 100. Yep, that's correct. This right here is our first quartile. This is our median. This is our third quartile. So all you have to do for the first quartile is quite literally just we have to break this up into its um, basically into the, a half. I, I think that's the best way to describe it. Let's see. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 15. So we go 7 from the left. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then 7 on the right. We're going to circle this here, right here. We're going to find the median of this right here. So it looks like, and again, the median, when you have an odd number, the median is just the middle number. So our first quartile is 70. What that means, if you want to think of it from a statistics point of view, 25% of the data lies to the left of this point. I don't think you guys have to know that for algebra, but just in case. So 
that's where this first little line should be, and it is. It's right at 70. The third quartile, we do the exact same thing. We're going to box these up. You don't have to box it. I just I purposefully do that. We do the same exact thing. Find the median for that number, and it looks like the number that's right in the middle, again, because it's odd, is 95. That's going to be this end of the box. Okay, that's true here. And then our median. Our median is just quite literally the number that's right in the middle that we circled. That should be an 80. Okay, now if you had an even number, what you have to do is get the two numbers that are right in the middle and take their average. Okay, we kind of got lucky here. We had all odd numbers. That was convenient. So we know that two is a correct representation of this data. So anything that does not have a two, a, a, look at that. We can cross that out. Um, and let's take a look at this last one. I'm going to try and get everything in one so you can see it. Um, what I want you to see for this last little histogram down here is it's basically saying five data set so there's five points of data that are in between 61 and 71 if you look i've got one two three four five that's true and it's saying i've got three data points in between 71 and 81 one two three that's true and there's three points three data points that are in between 81 and 91 one two three that's true and then 91 and 101 there should be four it looks it looks like five but that's a four and it looks one two three four so three is also correct so all of those are correct and that's why four is our answer choice. So we're given a recursively defined sequence below. If you don't know what recursively defined means, all it means is that if I wanna find a particular term, I need to look at one of the previous terms that came right before that. So if I knew that, if I had a sequence like one, two, three, blank, if I knew this was recursive, that would mean to find this one, I'd have to look back at a previous term. It could be the, the previous, but it could be the second previous or anything like that. I have to look at a previous term to get the current term. Okay, that's really what it means in a nutshell. I know that's a kind of a brief definition, but um, what this tells us, so a sub one, that's the first term in the sequence. So our first term is five. And we want to find a sub four. We want to find the fourth term in the sequence. What this is telling us is that if I want to get the next term, I need the current term times two, and I need to take away seven. Okay, so if I want to find a sub two, here's a one. If I want to find a sub two, what I need to do is, and I'll write it in this, this expression right here so you can see it. A sub two is equal to a sub one, because again, if, if n was equal to one, n is just the position. Here's n equals one n equals 2. It, it just tells us what position in the sequence are we. Um, a sub 2 is just 2 times, I forgot the 2 down there, it's double whatever the previous term, so a sub 1 is, minus 7. You and I happen to know what a sub 1 is because they give it to us. If they didn't, we'd be stuck. So we're going to double the second term. No, we're going to double the first term. I see the 2 and I say double. 2 times the first term, so 2 times 5, minus 7. So 10 minus 7, that gives us 3. Okay, so there's a sub 2. Now to find a sub 3, let me see if I can write this down here. a sub 3, we need the previous term. So again, the next term is just the, the current term. So a sub 2, I keep forgetting the double, 2 times a sub 2 minus 7. So again, you and I just found out a sub 2 is just equal to 3. So we're going to double that. So 2 times 3, that's 6. Minus 7, that's just negative 1. Okay, let me move this over a bit. And let's see, so for our last a sub 4, which is exactly what we're looking for, for the four, fourth term in the sequence, we need the third term, I almost, I keep forgetting, double, we need the double the uh, third term, so the previous term, minus 7. And again, we just found a sub 3, that was equal to negative 1, so 2 times negative 1, that's negative 2, and then minus 7, that gives us a minus 9. And it looks like that's it right here. So again, recursive, recursively defined sequences or recursive sequences literally just mean to get the current term, I need to look at a previous term. And it'll usually be like, okay, we'll double the previous term and add something or subtract something or something like that. But you're really just looking at a term that's previous doing something to that and that'll give you the current term. Okay, so if you're not comfortable with what I was just saying, a sub four and n equals four and all that stuff, uh, I'll put something in the description box, a really good uh, kind of a primer on what sequences are and what those terms that I was talking about are, because you definitely need to know those. This looks like a lot of gibberish if you're not comfortable with it, and it will definitely pop up at least, at least a couple times. So you want to make sure you know how to do these ones. 
24 is just asking us uh, which polynomial has a leading coefficient of 4 and a degree of 3. So these two vocab words you definitely got to remember. A degree of 3 or a degree in general of a polynomial basically just means what's the highest exponent? Which term has the highest exponent? So if you look um, down at number 2, the highest exponent that I see, and they'll try and trick you, so be careful. The highest exponent I see is a 3, so that would be a polynomial of degree 3. The leading coefficient is the coefficient of that term that has that degree. Okay, so in this case for number 2, the leading coefficient would be a 5. So we know it's not 2 because although it does have a degree of 3, the leading coefficient is a 5. If you look down uh, number 3, the highest exponent I see, that's a 4. So that would be a 4th degree polynomial, and that's not what we're looking for. And then for number 1, that, again, that's a, the highest exponent, again, that I see, that's a 4. That's a 4th degree polynomial or a polynomial of degree 4. So again, it can't be number 1. That only leaves us with number 4, but I do want you to see here, if you look, the highest exponent right here is a 3, and the coefficient attached to that is a 4. That's the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient is just the coefficient of the term with the highest exponent. All right, he made it to the end. <laughs> Make sure you like, subscribe, and share this video because I'll be posting more videos in the future, and we'll see you in the next one.